We're going to be continuing with chapter 11. This is part B for the nervous system and nervous tissue. If you haven't seen the first part, please be sure to uh, view that. You can find the link for it in the description below. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me directly. Again, you can find my email information in the description below. If you like the video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. And also, please be sure to subscribe and share with your friends, your classmates, anybody else that you think uh, may find it helpful. We learned that muscles have a resting membrane potential a couple of chapters ago. And neurons too, just like all cells, they also have a resting membrane potential. However, unlike most other cells, neurons have the ability to rapidly change the resting membrane potential. Neurons are said to be highly excitable cells. Our body is said to be electrically neutral because we have the same number of positive and negative charges. However, we have areas where there is one type of charge that predominates making such regions either more positively or negatively charged. Because opposite charges attract one another, energy has to be used to separate them. On the other hand, the coming together of opposite charges liberates energy that can be used to do work. And it's for this reason, when opposite charges are separated, the system has potential energy. We're going to be going over some definitions in the next few slides, and this is going to help us better understand what we're going to be talking about as we move through in this lecture. The measure of potential energy generated by separated charges is called voltage. Voltage is measured either in volts or millivolts. Voltage is always measured between two points, and it's called the potential difference, or simply the potential between the points. And it's this charge difference across the plasma membrane that results in the potential. The greater the difference in the charge between the two points, the higher the voltage we have. The flow of electrical charge from one point to another is called a current, and current can be used to do work. The amount of charge that moves between the two points depends on two factors, voltage and resistance. And resistance is the hindrance to charge flow provided by substances through which the current must pass. Substances that have high electrical resistance are said to be insulators, while substances with lower electrical resistance are said to be conductors. The relationship between voltage, current, and resistance is given by Ohm's law. Ohm's law essentially states that current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. This essentially tells us that current is directly proportional to voltage, which means that the greater the voltage, or the potential difference, the greater the current. It also tells us that there is no current flow between points that have the same potential. Ohm's law also tells us that the current is inversely proportional to resistance, which means the greater the resistance, the smaller the current. If you think back a handful of chapters ago when we discussed uh, uh, cells, we talked about the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, and we said that on the plasma membrane, it consisted of a, a variety of different types of uh, membrane proteins. And these membrane proteins, they acted as ion channels. Each one of these different type of membrane proteins, they were specific as to the type of ion that they would allow to pass. So for example, uh, some of them were potassium ion channels, so they would naturally allow potassium ions to pass through. Others were sodium ions, so they would allow sodium ions to pass through. These membrane channels, they are made up of large proteins, and their building blocks, the, these amino acids, they're often, you'll find them snaking back and forth across a membrane. Now, some of the channels are leakage, or these non-gated channels. These always stay open. In other parts, we have channels that are called, are said to be uh, gated. In other words, they have kind of like a, a, a door that opens and closes. So these proteins, they change shape to open and close this uh, channel in response to specific signals. So when it's open, then again, the, the ions are able to pass through. When they're closed, the ions will not be able to pass through. So the leakage or the non-gated channels and the gated channels are the two main types of ion channels that we have. Now, the three main gated channels that we find are chemically gated, voltage gated, and mechanically gated. Mechanically gated channels open and close in response to physical deformation of receptors. And we see this in sensory receptors for touch and pressure. In this illustration, uh, you can see that what we have here is this chemically gated channel. So in this uh, image right over here, we have this protein where uh, that's forming this channel, and then at this point it's closed. So when the appropriate receptor comes, this is the, the, its receptor site, when you have the pr appropriate chemical that comes and opens this up, as you see in this picture, then ions are able to move in and out. So in this case, again, you got sodium moving in, potassium moving out. So again, notice what happens when the receptor comes in on and binds to the protein. The shape of the protein changes, and this is what allows these ions to move in and out of the cell. And in this image here, we have this voltage-gated ion channel. So what we see over here, again, these gates right over here at this point, they're closed. And when the polarity of the 
uh, plasma membrane in the inside of the cell, um, it changes. So now what you see is you have uh, this side is, is uh, polarized at this point. So when it becomes depolarized that you see over here, when this membrane voltage changes, at that point this gate opens up and now these sodium ions are able to enter. When gated ion channels are open, ions diffuse quickly across the membrane following their electrical chemical gradients. This creates electrical currents and voltage changes across the membrane. Ions move along chemical concentration gradients when they diffuse passively from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and along electrical gradients when they move towards an area of the opposite electrical charge. Together, electrical and concentration gradients constitute the electrical chemical gradient. So the ion flow creates an electrical current and it changes the voltage across the membrane. This is expressed by rearranging the Ohm's law equation. V is equal to I times R, or voltage, which is equal to current times resistance. A voltmeter is able to measure the potential difference, or the charge, across a membrane of a resting cell. The resting membrane potential of a resting neuron is approximately negative 70 millivolts. Now the cytoplasmic side of the membrane is negatively charged relative to the outside, which is going to be more positively charged. And this is when the membrane is said to be polarized. Now depending on the type of neuron that you're looking at, the actual voltage difference, it'll vary anywhere from between negative 40 millivolts to negative 90 millivolts. The resting membrane potential is generated by the differences in the ionic makeup of the intracellular and extracellular fluids, and by the differential permeability of the plasma membrane to those ions. So in this image we see we have a voltmeter over here, or a voltometer, and this is a neuron. And this is a probe that's being placed inside of this neuron. And this is the probe, this is part of the probe that's being uh, placed or left in the extracellular fluid. And when we take a measurement, we find that the voltage across this membrane that's generated is minus 70 millivolts. Now let's take a look at the ionic makeup of the intracellular and the extracellular fluids. The extracellular fluid has a higher concentration of sodium than the intracellular fluid. So in the extracellular fluid, the positive charges of sodium and other cations, they're balanced primarily by chloride ions. The intracellular fluid, it has a higher concentration of potassium and a lower concentration of sodium than the extracellular fluid does. The negatively charged proteins help to balance the positive charges of the intracellular cations. And although we find many other solutes such as glucose, urea, and other ions in both the extracellular and intracellular fluids, potassium plays the most important role in generating the membrane potential. Be sure you view this animation here. Uh, this goes over the resting membrane potential. Again, you can find this uh, on uh, the Pearson website, or you can look for it on YouTube. In addition to that, your book should have come with the DVD, uh, so you can uh, look for this video on there as well. This image here is showing you that the concentrations of sodium and potassium on each side of the membrane are different. So when you look over here, these are these sodium and potassium pumps that are maintaining this concentration gradient for sodium and potassium across this membrane. And when you look over here on the outside of the cell, you see that for potassium, it has a concentration of 5 millimoles. And then when you look at on the inside of the cell, potassium has uh, a concentration of 140 millimoles. And as for sodium, again, sodium is less concentrated on the inside of the cell and it's more concentrated on the outside. So you have the opposite. You have a 140 uh, millimole concentration for sodium on the outside and you have only 15 millimoles of sodium on the inside of the cell. So the sodium potassium pump, what it's doing is that it's sending out three ions of sodium and it's bringing back in two ions of potassium. So it's actually going against the concentration gradient. Therefore, it uses energy. So this is an ATPase pump. Now let's take a look at the differential permeability of the membrane to various ions. At rest, the membrane is impermeable to the large anionic cytoplasmic proteins. It's very slightly permeable to sodium, which are passing through the leakage channels, and sodium will diffuse into the cell down its concentration gradient. And it's about 100 times more permeable to potassium than it is to sodium, and that's because there's a lot more leakage channels. Now, potassium diffuses out of the cell down its concentration gradient, and it's quite freely permeable to chloride ions as well. So this number is incorrect. It's not 20 times more permeable. It's actually anywhere between, depending on which text you're reading uh, currently, as of November 2015, uh, it's going to say, your textbooks will say anywhere between 75 times to 100 times more permeable. So uh, if I were you, please be sure you to go and speak to your professor because on an exam, you don't want a surprise. You don't want the professor giving the answer uh, that your book says.
which may incorrectly say 25 or 50. But uh, so you guys know, the correct uh, number is 100 times, uh, not 25 times. Because we have a lot more potassium ions that are diffusing out of the cell than the tiny amount of sodium ions that are diffusing into the cell, it results in the inside of the cell being more negative. And this is what establishes the resting membrane potential. Because some potassium is always leaking out of the cell and some sodium is always leaking into the cell, you'd think that after some time, equilibrium would eventually be reached. This does not happen, and the reason for that is because of the sodium-potassium pump. It's also known as the sodium-potassium ATPase. So this means that it requires energy, it requires ATP. And what it does is that it stabilizes the resting membrane potential. It maintains a concentration gradient for sodium and potassium. So keep in mind, what's happening is this. We're having, uh, we have potassium, where we have a higher concentration on the inside of the cell, and it's being pumped out. Okay, we have less potassium on the outside of the cell. So what's gonna, what's gonna wanna happen is, uh, you're gonna wanna go from areas of low concentration, Potassium wants to go from area of low concentration to higher concentration. It wants to follow its concentration gradient. And the same holds true for sodium. Sodium wants to come into the cell. So this pump, it's preventing that from happening. What it's doing, it's keeping the concentration of sodium greater on the outside, and it's keeping the concentration of potassium greater on the inside. And the way that it's doing that is it's pumping three sodium ions out of the cell, and at the same time it's bringing in two potassium ions to the inside of the cell. So what I'm going to do is try to summarize what we learned over the last few slides with this picture over here. So what they're showing you over here is this, uh, again, this is a plasma membrane that's facing the outside of the cell. This is the side of the plasma membrane that's facing the inside of the cell. And over here we have these leakage channels uh, that are for potassium. And remember what we learned, we said that there's a lot more leakage channels for potassium than there are for sodium, which you see over here. Something that they didn't tell you is that we also have leakage channels for chloride ions. And what I did is I drew this by these pink lines or whatever, this uh, fuchsia colored lines that you see over here. Um, and then also remember what we said, we also have these sodium potassium pumps, which you can see in this uh, uh, picture down over here. Now, let's keep in mind, what is the concentration of, uh, where, or yeah, what is the concentration, where is the concentration of potassium greater, on the outside or inside? And again, the correct answer is that the concentration of potassium is going to be far greater on the inside of the cell than it is on the outside. So here, I'm drawing these little Ks over here with the plus sign to represent that these uh, that we have a lot more potassium ions on the inside of the cell than on the outside. And what do we have a lot more on the outside of the cell than we do on the inside are a lot more sodium ions. So I put some... Uh, Again, I, here, here we go. There's our sodium ions. And also, we have a lot more chloride ions on the outside than we do on the inside. On the inside, we have very few chloride ions. Uh, so, and here we go. I'm going to put eh, only two of these chloride ions on the inside. And let's put uh, a few sodium ions on the inside as well, just so we know what we're, we're dealing with over here. Now, as we move along, What's going to happen is this. Keep in mind that because we have a lot more potassium ions, these potassium ions, they're going to want to go outside. Because remember, they want to go along their concentration gradient. So they want to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. There's very little potassium on the outside. We have a lot more on the inside. So these guys want to go outside. And remember, what's our resting, mem uh, resting membrane potential initially? It's at minus 90 millivolts. Now, as these potassium ions start to move out, What's going to happen is this. As these guys start to move out, they start to shuttle out, and the outside of this plasma membrane, it becomes positive. Now keep in mind, on the inside the, of the, the plasma membrane, this is going to be more negative. And one of the main reasons that this is going to be more negative is because of all the proteins that we have on the inside. Okay? And those proteins, we have a lot of them in the, on the inside of the cell, and they're mostly, they're negatively charged. They're slightly negatively charged. So because of all this amount of proteins that we have in the inside of the cell, we get a much more negative charge on the inside. In addition, in addition to that, also when the chloride ions that are moving in, they will also become, uh, they help it, uh, the inside of the cell to become a little bit more negative as well. Now, one thing that I want to mention to you is that these chloride ions, remember, they're negatively charged. And uh, 
the inside of this plasma membrane is also negatively charged. So what happens with like charged particles, they will repel one another. So even though we have a lot of these chloride ions in the outside uh, and not too much in the inside, they have a much harder time to come in because, you know, they're being repelled. They're being constantly pushed against, uh, pushed out or not pushed out, but, you know, they, they have resistance. So it's, it's much harder for them to come in. Uh, they're able to freely move in through these uh, leakage channels, but this light charge, it again, it forms a hindrance for them to, to, to come in. Now, as we move forward, as these potassium ions are moving out, and what's be and also because we have a, a lot of these sodium uh, positively charged sodium ions on the outside, we have this more positively uh, positive charge on the outside than we do on the inside. So this side is going to be much more positive than on the inside, which is going to be more negative. Now, uh, also, so I put these PRs over here, these proteins, they represent the, the negatively charged proteins that we have on the inside. So as these potassium ions are diffusing out of the cell, remember, they're diffusing out at a very high rate because we have a lot more of these guys. Now, even though they're, sh they're showing a 2 to 1, this doesn't represent what we actually have because we have a lot more potassium leakage channels than we do sodium. So imagine you have maybe 10 of these leakage channels and only one of these sodium channels. So we have a lot more of these potassium ions that are going out. And what's happening is this. As these potassium ions are starting to leave out, this number is starting to go down as well. It's starting to lower. So now we went from minus 90 millivolts to, oh, let's say about minus 65 or minus 60. But what's keeping this number not from reaching zero is that, uh, well, there's a couple of different things that we're going to be talking about. But one of those things is, in this step that you can see, is the movement of these uh, sodium ions in. Because these sodium ions are moving inside, it helps stabilize this to about minus 70. Okay? Now, the next thing that we see over here, then in this image down over here, is that we have this uh, sodium potassium pump and the sodium potassium pump is what's actually helping keep this number stable at this minus 70. What this pump is doing is that it's working against the concentration gradient. Now it does this by use of ATP and so this is an ATPase pump and uh, it's pumping out three potassium ions and it's pulling back in two potassium ions. So remember what we said the concentration of potassium is what? It's much higher on the inside than it is on the outside. So remember, potassium, wanna, the potassium ions want to go out, but this guy, this pump here, is going against the concentration gradient. So even though we only have a little bit of potassium on the outside, it's pulling them back in and it's sucking back inside. Okay, it's bringing them back inside. And then even though the sodium is much uh, lower on the inside and uh, much higher on the outside, it's grabbing the sodium ions that are inside and it's sending them back on the outside. So this constant movement of these potassium ions inside and outside is maintaining both uh, the negative, uh, this uh, uh, polarity over here of minus 70 millivolts. And it's, again, it's helping this side stay negative. In addition, it's helping uh, keep the outside of the plasma membrane more positive. So let's go through this one more time. We have this plasma membrane over here. This is the outside and this is the inside. And these are the leakage channels. We have leakage channels for potassium, we have a leakage channel for sodium, and we have four chloride ions. Uh, the outside of the cell, we find a lot of sodium ions and chloride ions. On the inside, we have uh, mostly uh, potassium ions. In addition to, we have the, a lot of uh, protein uh, molecules inside. Protein molecules are going to be negative, negatively charged. The potassium ions are positively charged. Because we have a lot of these protein, ion, uh, protein uh, molecules in the inside of the cell, it causes the, the inside of the cell to become to be more negative. However, as these potassium ions are exiting, keep in mind we have lots and lots and lots of these potassium ions. So we have this huge uh, flow of potassium going out of the cell. That creates the interior of the cell to be more electrically negative and it creates this electrical gradient, this negative voltage uh, on the inside uh, of the plasma membrane. However, on the outside, now that we have all this extra potassium and uh, this uh, sodium ion that's present, the outside of the plasma membrane is going to be positive. Now we do have chloride ions that are entering as well. So as the chloride ions are entering, in addition to the sodium ions that are entering, it further uh, it will help uh, uh, cause the, the voltage to reach back to minus 70 millivolts. So as these potassium ions are, are exiting over here, what's happening is the voltage drops down to minus 90. And as the sodium ion and some of these chloride ions are entering the, 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 the cell, it will uh, rise back to minus 70. Now what's maintaining this is the, this, um, 
sodium potassium pump. Keep in mind, as far as for the chloride ion goes, as I mentioned earlier, because chloride ions are negative and this side of the plasma membrane is also negative, it's not very easy for it to come inside. Although they are free, able to freely move in, there is a repulsion that's going on, uh, that's occurring because of these uh, the like charges. The sodium uh, uh, potassium pump is pumping out three sodium ions and is bringing in two potassium ions. This is going against the concentration gradient, so it requires energy, it requires ATP. So as the potassium ions are exiting, the voltage reaches minus 90 millivolts inside the cell's interior. As the sodium ions start to enter, at that point it starts to reach minus 70 millivolts. And then the sodium and potassium pump, uh, by it uh, ejecting the sodium ions and bringing back in the potassium ion, maintains this minus 70 millivolt electrical voltage inside of the cell. Neurons use the changes that are produced in their membrane potential as a communication signal for receiving, integrating, and sending information. Changes to the membrane potential can occur in a couple of different ways. One way is when concentrations of ions across the membrane changes, and the other is when membrane permeability to ions change. Now these changes, they produce two types of signals. One is called graded potentials and the other is called action potentials. In graded potentials, these are incoming signals that are operating over short distances. And for action potentials, these are long distance signals that we see traveling through axons. Depolarization and hyperpolarization. These terms describe the membrane potential changes relative to the resting membrane potential. Depolarization is a reduction in the membrane potential. So the inside of the membrane is becoming less negative. It moves closer to zero and the probability of producing an impulse increases. So for example, this could be a change in resting potential from minus 65 millivolts to minus 50 millivolts. In other words, we're moving closer to zero. Hyperpolarization occurs when the membrane potential increases. In other words, we're moving further and further away from zero. This causes the inside of the membrane to become more negative than the resting membrane potential. This will also decrease the probability of producing an impulse. So the example could be given that we're going from, we're having a change from minus 70 millivolts to minus 90 millivolts. So this is an example of hyperpolarization. In this image here, it's showing you that when we measure the voltage uh, across the plasma membrane, and uh, so when we apply a depolarizing stimulus, you'll see that the resting uh, potential starts off at minus 70 millivolts. And when the stimulus is applied, the depolarizing stimulus is applied, then the membrane potential, it changes, or the voltage changes from minus 70 to, oh, say roughly about minus 65 for the duration that the stimulus applied, before it reaches back down to minus 70, before it goes back to its resting potential. And in this case over here, Again, we're starting off with the resting potential at minus 70, and in this situation, a hyperpolarizing stimulus is applied. And during the duration that the stimulus is applied, the voltage, it drops to minus about, for example, minus 75, let's call it. And then when it's lifted, the hyperpolarizing stimulus is lifted, it goes back to its resting potential of minus 70 millivolts. Graded potentials are short-lived localized changes in membrane potential that can be either depolarizations or hyperpolarizations. Graded potentials are called graded because their magnitude varies directly with the stimulus strength. So the stronger the stimulus, the more the voltage changes and the farther the current flows. They're triggered by some change in the neurons environment that causes the gated ion channels to open. They're named according to where they're found and the functions they perform. When the receptors of a sensory neuron is excited by some form of energy, such as heat or light, the resulting grading potential is called a receptor potential or a generator potential. When the stimulus is a neurotransmitter released by another neuron, the graded potential is called a postsynaptic potential because the neurotransmitter is released into a fluid-filled gap called the synapse and it influences the neuron beyond the synapse. And this image over here, it's showing you a small patch of that membrane that has been depolarized. And this is this area right over here. So notice where, in this, where the stimulus is applied, uh, on the outside it changes from positive to negative, and on the inside it changes from being negative to positive. Once the gated ion channel opens, depolarization spreads from one area of the membrane to the next. The flow of current to adjacent membrane areas changes the membrane potential there as well. However, most of the charge is quickly lost through leakage channels. So the current dies out within a few millimeter of its origin and it's said to be decremental. So this image over here, this graph is showing the spread and decay of a graded potential.
So the y-axis is showing voltage and the x-axis is showing distance in millimeters. Uh, and this area right over here, this is the site of initial depolarization or the active area. So as you can see, as we start moving further away from this active area, the voltage starts to decrease. So, and again, this is because of these leaky, uh, mem uh, the, the leaky plasma membrane that we have, that the voltage starts to decline with the distance from the active area. And this is why these graded potentials are short distance signals. The principal way neurons send signals over long distance is by generating and propagating action potentials. Only muscle cells and the axons of neurons are able to generate an action potential. A depolarization phase is followed by a repolarization phase and often a short period of hyperpolarization. The whole event happens over a few milliseconds. And unlike graded potentials, action potentials, they don't decrease in strength with distance. In neurons, an action potential is also called a nerve impulse and is typically generated only in axons. A neuron transmits a nerve impulse only when it's adequately stimulated. The stimulus changes the permeability of the neuron's membrane by opening specific voltage-gated channels on the axon. So there's four main steps in generating an action potential. The very first step is this resting state. And in this state, all the gated sodium and potassium channels, they're closed. The only thing that's open are these leakage channels for both sodium and pot potassium. They're never closed. Uh, and this is maintaining the resting membrane potential, if you remember back a handful of slides. Each sodium channel, it has two voltage-sensitive gates. It has an activation gate and an inactivation gate. This activation gate, this is kind of like the main door, the big gate, and it's closed at rest. It opens with depolarization, and when it opens, it allows sodium to enter the cell. The inactivation gate, it opens when it's at rest, but it goes and blocks the channel once it's open to prevent more sodium from entering the cell. So in this image over here, what you see is this, uh, so this is the sodium channel over here, and uh, this voltage-gated sodium channel. And uh, this is, they're showing you, this is the outside of the cell, this is the inside of the cell. And again, at rest, you can see that uh, this activation gate is closed, right over here. This is the activation gate. And this is the inactivation gate. And you can see that the inactivation gate is open when it's at rest. And this activation gate is what's closed at rest. So when we have a minimum threshold uh, that reaches this uh, voltage-gated sodium channel, the activation gate will open, and this uh, inactivation gate will stay open for a very brief time. Soon after, once we have the influx of sodium, this inactivation gate will go and close this channel, preventing further sodium from entering the cell. And this is a voltage-gated channel for potassium. So one of the things that you want to notice is that for sodium, Sodium has two gates, whereas potassium has only one gate. And this potassium gated channel, as you can see over here, it's closed uh, at the resting state, so no potassium is able to exit. And once the potassium gated channel has been depolarized, then the potassium is able to exit the cell. And as we saw in the previous picture, the second part of the previous picture, each potassium channel has only one voltage sensitive gate and it's closed at rest and it will open slowly with depolarization. And in this image here, we can see these voltage gated sodium channels and their two gates. This is the activation gates over here and this guy over here, this is this inactivation gate. And this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell. So you can see that in the outside of the cell, we have these sodium ions that want to enter inside. So at the resting state, the activation gates are closed, so the sodium ions are not able to pass in. Uh, similarly, also, this uh, inactivation gate, it stays open, but it's not, it doesn't make a difference because the first gate, this activation gate, is closed, so this has no effect on that. Now, in the second part, when depolarization occurs, these activation gates open, and then the sodium ions, they enter inside the cell. And when this happens, this uh, inactivation gate, it doesn't close immediately, but it just slightly after the influx of sodium, it is going to go in and close off this gate. So it's going to be blocking uh, further sodium from entering the cell. So this image is showing you what's happening at number one. And this is going to be representing what you see on the graph as number one as well. So at the resting state, what's shown is that both sodium and potassium voltage gated channels are closed. So potassium is not able to exit the cell and sodium is not able to enter the cell. 
Now let's take a look at step two, depolarization. This is when we have sodium channels opening up. So a depolarizing local currents open up these voltage-gated sodium channels. So both activation and inactivation gates are open. And we end up getting sodium rushing inside the cell. So this influx of sodium is going to cause more depolarization, which opens up more sodium channels. Because of that, the intracellular fluid, it becomes less negative. When we reach the threshold, which is about negative 55 to negative 50 millivolts, positive feedback, it causes the opening of additional sodium channels. As a result, we end up getting this large action potential spike, and the membrane polarity, it jumps up to a positive 30 millivolts. And in this image over here, you can see on this graph that we had a depolarizing current that's passed through. So what that does over here, it translates into opening these sodium voltage gated channels. So both activation and inactivation gates are open. Now sodium is going to be able to pass through into the inside of the cell. Step three is repolarization. So we have sodium channels that are inactivating and the potassium channels that are open. When the sodium channel's inactivation gates close, the membrane's permeability to sodium, it declines back to the resting state. In addition to that, the action potential spike, it also stops rising. When the voltage-gated potassium channels open, potassium ions will exit the cell down its concentration gradient. This ends up resulting in repolarization, so the membrane returns back to its resting membrane potential. So when you look at this image over here, uh, on this graph, you can see that the voltage is going down. It's going back down to its resting membrane potential. And how that happens is that at these sodium voltage-gated sodium channels, the inactivation gate comes and closes up. It plugs up this channel. Now sodium is not able to enter. So because the sodium is not able to enter, what's happening? This is one of the reasons why this is starting to go down. But at the same time, the other thing that's contributing to this is that the potassium, the voltage-gated potassium channel is open, and now potassium is exiting the cell. So as the potassium exits, because remember, it's electrical, it's positively charged. So as it's going out, what's happening? It's starting to become more and more electrically negative. So now this is how this we end up getting the surge uh, going back down to its resting membrane potential. In step four, hyperpolarization, some of the potassium channels stay open while the sodium channels reset. So while most of the voltage-gated potassium channels close, the ones that do stay open, they allow extra potassium ions to leave the cell. And this causes the membrane to become more negative on the inside than in the resting state. So this is what causes hyperpolarization of the membrane. At the same time, we also have sodium channels that are beginning to reset. So in this image here, you can see when you look at this graph that this is the resting membrane potential, but the voltage, it further drops below. So what happens is this, when you look at this sodium, the voltage gated sodium channel, the inactivation gate swings out of the way and the activation gate closes. At the same time, when you look at this uh, voltage gated potassium uh, channel, this stays open. And because it's open, excess potassium is leaving. And this extra potassium that's leaving the cell is what's resulting in this hyperpolarization. And in this slide over here, it's a run through of all four steps that we just uh, went over. So let's just go through these uh, together one more time. Uh, so in the first step, the resting state, notice that both the activation and the inactivation gates are closed in both the sodium and the potassium voltage gated channels. So uh, what's happening is we're at the resting state. Okay, so we're at this state right over here. So let's just say this is minus 70. In the step two, we end up getting a current, a local current that arrives. And you can see that by this, uh, the spike in this, uh, in this graph. So when this happens, the sodium voltage gated channel, it opens up. Now sodium is able to enter the cell. As the sodium is entering, this is, this is starting to go up. Okay, this is what's causing this spike to occur. In the third step, we have repolarization. So the second step is depolarization, right? Because why? It's becoming less an electronegative. It's becoming less negative. It's becoming more positive. So remember, we're going from minus 70 all the way up to positive 30. Now, in the third step, we're going back down to this. Uh, we're repolarizing. So we're going back down to uh, minus 70. And in what's happening in this step is that this inactivation gate, it comes and plugs up on the sodium uh, ion channel. And when this happens, sodium is not able to enter anymore. At the same time, the potassium voltage gated ion channel, it opens up and potassium starts to leave. So as the potassium is leaving and the sodium is not entering, the voltage starts to drop back down to the resting membrane potential.
Then finally in the fourth step, when you look at this graph over here, we can see that the voltage continues to drop below than that of the resting membrane potential. So what's happening is this. When you're looking at this sodium voltage-gated channel, uh, it resets. So it's now closed. This activation gate comes in and closes up. The inactivation gate pulls out of the way. But this is the area of main interest, the voltage-gated potassium channel. Not all of them close. The ones that stay open allow extra potassium ions to leave the cell. And it's this excess potassium ions that's leaving the cell that's causing this hyperpolarization to occur. And after a short period of time, all these voltage-gated potassium channels will close. And the sodium-potassium pump will end up restoring the voltage back to its resting state. And be sure you watch this video for generation of an action potential. Again, go to the Pearson website, look for it on YouTube, or use the DVD that may have come with your book. In the third step in repolarization, only the electrical conditions are being restored, not the ionic conditions. And if you remember, after the repolarization, after the third stage, we have hyperpolarization. We have an extra amount of potassium that's exiting the cell. So we have this ionic imbalance of what's supposed to be outside of the cell and what's supposed to be in the inside of the cell. And what restores that back to its normal state or to the resting state are the sodium and potassium pumps. Going back to this image, if you remember, the concentration of sodium is supposed to be much higher on the inside of the cell than it is on the outside of the cell. And the opposite for sodium. Sodium concentration is going to be much higher on the outside of the cell than it is on the inside of the cell. Now keep in mind what happens in, through all these four steps that we just went through. If you remember, in the second step, we had an influx of sodium inside the cell. And then in the third and fourth steps, what we had was potassium that was leaving the cell. So what ended up happening is, we had lots of potassium going out of the cell, but the sodium that came inside is still on the inside. So how are we going to balance this ionic concentration out? And this is where these guys come in, these sodium-potassium pumps. It's going to spit out the extra sodium that's still inside the cell, and it's going to bring back in the extra potassium that's outside the cell. So it's going to sp every t The way that these guys work, if you remember going back, is that they take out three sodium ions, and they pull back in two potassium ions. Not all depolarization events is going to produce an action potential. In order for an axon to fire, depolarization, it has to reach the threshold voltage in order to trigger the action potential. At the threshold, we have the membrane that's been depolarized by 15 to 20 millivolts from the resting value. We also have sodium permeability that increases. So it's this influx of sodium that exceeds that potassium efflux that triggers off this positive feedback cycle. So as more and more sodium is entering, it's causing additional sodium channels to open up. And the all in one principle says that an action potential either happens completely or doesn't happen at all. Propagation allows the action potential to be transmitted from the origin down the entire axon length towards the terminals. The sodium influx through the voltage gates in one membrane area causes local currents to open the sodium voltage gates in the adjacent membrane areas. This leads to depolarizations of that area, which in turn causes depolarizations of the next area. And this goes on and on throughout the length of the axon until we reach the axon terminal. Once initiated, an action potential is self-propagating. In non-myelinated axons, each successive segment of membrane depolarizes, then it repolarizes. In myelinated axon, propagation is different. So what happens between the two is this. In this, in myelinated axons, conduction or depolarization, the action potential, it regenerates only at the nodes of RON VA. Because uh, at the other parts uh, of the axon where it's myelinated, we don't have that many sodium voltage gated channels. Only we find a very high concentration of these uh, voltage gated sodium channels at the nodes of RON VA. So the action potential, it jumps from node to node to node. And it's the myelin sheet that does the conduction between the nodes. And we call this salutary conduction. And this happens at a very fast speed. It, it happens at a rate of about 100 meters per second. Whereas in non-myelinated axons, it happens much slower at a speed of only 2 meters per second. Since the sodium channels closer to the action potential origin are still inactivated, new action potentials cannot be generated there. Action potentials, they occur only in a forward moving direction. So when you look at this slide and probably the next couple of ones afterwards, uh, let's just take a look at this legend before. So the yellow represents the resting potential and the red represents uh, the peak of the action potential or where the action potential is occurring and uh, the gray represents hyperpolarization. So what we're seeing over here and then we have this graph over here and what we're seeing here is an error. This should say negative 70, not positive 70.
uh, because this is this resting uh, potential over here, right over here. So this is this point uh, that we see. This is where the electrode has been inserted. And uh, if you notice, again, the outside of the, the, the nerve cell is positive, the inside is negative. So the action potential right now, it's, it's over here at this point. And remember, it's going to be moving forward. It's moving down in this direction. So because this, these cells have been, uh, these sodium channels are opened up over here, so they've turned positive. And in turn, these guys are going to make this positive, and then this will make these guys positive. So it's moving along this entire way. So remember, as you have extra sodium ions, these uh, influx of sodium ions that enter, and remember, once we read that, once we reach that threshold, then this action potential will move along the entire way. We get propagation that, that takes place. And this is what we're looking at right now. So what this says is at zero milliseconds, um, again, the action potential hasn't reached, reached this point where this electrode is inserted. When you move on to the next side, at two milliseconds, now that action potential has reached this point where the electrode is inserted. And notice what happened before. This part that's been uh, two milliseconds prior to that, now this has gone back. It's still not back at its resting potential, but uh, it's hyperpolarized at this point. So what this means is that it's not at a state where it can be, uh, where it can conduct another action potential, okay? It cannot undergo uh, depolarization again at this point. So as you see, what happens when the action potential does reach uh, the electrode is that we end up getting a spike in or a peak in the action potential on this graph. So now we're at positive 30 millivolts. This is again an error. They should say negative 70 because this is the resting uh, membrane potential, the resting potential. And this is the uh, where we have an influx of sodium that's entering the cell. So keep in mind, uh, remember when we looked at those four steps, at this step, at this stage, this is, we're at number two right now. So we have an excess sodium that's flowing inside the cell. And as that extra sodium is entering the inside the cell, it's causing these adjacent, uh, the, these uh, channels that are present here to open up uh, also. So this is what's causing these, uh, these voltage gated channels, these, uh, these adjacent voltage sodium gated channels to open up is this excess flow of sodium inside. Because remember, once they reach that threshold, okay? So uh, if you're able to decrease it by about uh, 20 millivolts, then it's going to end up going this entire way. And that's what we're seeing taking place right over here. So let's see what happens at the next slide. And in this image over here, we're seeing what's happening at 4 milliseconds. So remember, this is this 4 milliseconds is representing uh, only what's occurring at this point. This is where the electrode is inserted. So what we see over here is that uh, at 4 milliseconds, this part of the, the nerve cell, it's hi undergoing hyperpolarization. Okay, and we know that because uh, because of this legend, that's what it's telling us. And also because we learned about this, about these four steps uh, a handful of slides ago. So right over here, this is steps three and four that took place. So uh, remember, this is step two. So if you think about it, this is step one, this is step two, this part that's coming down here, this is step three. Now we're at step number four. So what's happening over here is this. Uh, at this point, the sodium channels, they are closed. The sodium voltage channels are closed. And the potassium voltage channels, some of them are open, but probably just about all of them are closed again as well. And right now we have the, the sodium potassium pumps that are working. They're the ones that are sending out all the extra sodium ions and they're bringing back in the potassium ions inside the cell. And so this is what's happening over here at this point. Now, but when you look further down the line, okay, moving forward, you'll see that this part of the uh, the nerve cell has now been polarized. So it's, or depolarized, I'm sorry. This part of the cell has been depolarized. So this action potential is moving, it's continuing to move forward. And this is the case, it's gonna continue to happen over and over and over again. So remember, what initially happened over here at the zero milliseconds interval is that we had an action potential that was at this point. In other words, uh, sodium ions, they entered through this sodium voltage gated channel. When, this, when the sodium entered over here, there were additional sodium voltage gated channels that are, that are found throughout this entire length of this uh, axon. So when the sodium ions entered over here, they ended up opening the, the gates at the adjacent sodium voltage gated channels. So now what ended up happening is the actual potential went over here. And then when these guys opened up, when the sodium voltage ch gated channels opened up over here, we had an additional amount of sodium that entered. So when the extra sodium that entered uh, through these new points, then they ended up opening up the sodium uh, voltage gated channels that were adjacent to it. So this happens on and on and on until we got to this point over here. And this is what we measured at this at two milliseconds.
and then at 4 milliseconds this process is continuing guys so there we have these sodium voltage gated channels throughout this entire uh, the, throughout the entire length of this axon so as you move forward this um, action potential it just keeps moving forward in other words it's propagating throughout the length of this axon and what we're seeing over here is that at this point that this cell is not going to be able to uh, depolarize again because it's still under going hyperpolarization. However, at this point, if another action potential was applied, it would depolarize. Action potentials are all alike, and once they're generated, all action potentials are independent of stimulus strength. So how is the central nervous system able to determine whether a particular stimulus is intense or weak? The answer is quite simple. It's by the frequency of impulses. Frequency is a number of impulses received per second. So the higher the frequency, that means the stronger the stimulus. So essentially, the stronger the stimulus, the more nerve impulses or action potentials that are going to be generated in a given time period. So when you look at this uh, image over here, this graph, this is showing you the stimulus in volts. So when you see over here, uh, again, this is uh, the threshold that needs to be met. And uh, this is the membrane potential that we're seeing of a neuron uh, across the gap, uh, across uh, the, the neuron's uh, cell membrane. And uh, again, so this is the resting membrane potential of minus 70. And uh, when you look over here, when there's uh, no voltage at all, when the voltage is zero, in other words, there's no stimulus being applied, the the, the resting the, the membrane is at this its resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. Now, when we increase the the stimulus, when we add voltage, in other words, then we start seeing these uh, the depolarization uh, occur over here. Okay. Now, when we increase this stimulus, what ends up happening is the higher the voltage, the more action potentials we get. So essentially, this is the coding uh, for uh, the stimulus intensity that goes to the CNS. So the more frequencies uh, that you see, already, the more action potentials, essentially it's translating into higher stimulus. So the more stimulus, we end up getting more impulses, more action potentials taking place. The refractive period is the time in which the neuron is not able to trigger another action potential, regardless of how strong the stimulus is. This is because the voltage-gated sodium channels are open. And we have two types of refractory periods. We have the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. In the absolute refractory period, this is the time from when the sodium channels open until the time it resets to the original resting state. And this is two things. First, it ensures that each action potential is a separate all or none event. And secondly, it enforces a one-way transmission of the action potential. So if you remember a handful of slides back when we looked at the four steps of generating an action potential, this would be step two. So when we move on to the relative refractory period, we're looking at steps three and four. And this follows the absolute refractory period. So during this period, most of the sodium channels have returned back to their resting state, while we still have some potassium channels that are still open. And what we have going on in here is repolarization taking place. The threshold for the action generation is elevated at this point. So only an exceptionally strong stimulus is going to be able to stimulate an action potential. All right, in this slide over here, we're looking at this graph, which is showing the absolute and relative refractory periods in an action potential. And to better understand this graph, Make sure you understand the four basic steps in generating action potential. Uh, if you're not too clear about that or if you forgot, make sure you rewind the video and you look at that. Uh, I think you go back maybe 10, 15 slides before. You'll see that when we go over that. Um, so I will, I'll be going over that also, but I'm not going to dip too much in detail uh, because we already discussed that. Now, keep in mind that in this light green area over here, this is an absolute refractory period, and what this means is that regardless of how strong of a stimulus you apply during this point in time, you're not going to get another depolarization event to take place. However, in this dark blue area, if you apply a stimulus strong enough, in other words, if a strong enough stimulus is applied, you can get another depolarization event to take place. Now, let's start from over here. So, this minus 70, where you see this flat line over here, this is step number one. In other words, both the sodium and the potassium uh, voltage-gated channels are closed. Okay, and we're at this minus 70 um, uh, millivolts. When the stimulus is applied right over here at zero seconds, what ends up happening is the, um, so the, the voltage-gated sodium channels, they'll open up. And once they, when they open up, we end up getting an influx of sodium that enters the cell. And it's this influx of sodium that enters the cell that causes this depolarization event to take place. And this is step number two right now, okay, up to this peak. 
at step number three, this is this part over here, okay, that we're going down. This is step number three. What's happening is that the the inactivation gates at the sodium voltage gated channels, they come in and they close this sodium gated channel. So now no more sodium is able to enter. At the same time, the voltage gated potassium channels open up. When the voltage gated potassium channels open up, potassium starts to leave. Okay, and as the potassium is leaving, we end up getting this repolarization that's taking place. So remember, two things are happening. First, potassium is leaving, and second, no more sodium is entering. Okay, so this is why we're moving back down to this negative 70 uh, point. However, we don't stop over here. We continue to go down, okay, well below minus 70. And this is when hyperpolarization is taking place. So this is step number four. And step number four, what ends up happening is this. The sodium gated voltage channels they reset okay so these inactivation gates pull out and the activation gates they end up coming in and closing uh, at this sodium voltage gated channels and also at the potassium gated voltage channels they also close but some of them they stay open and it's because of these extra uh, uh, potassium uh, it's because of these extra voltage gated potassium channels that are still open why we end up getting this hyperpolarization, okay? Because we these potassium ions are still continuing to leave the cell. So even after the 70, these some of these potassium uh, voltage gated channels that are open, we're getting potassium continuing to leak out. And as they're going out, we go well below the minus 70 point. So now we're at maybe minus 90. And as you learn, what ends up happening is the the sodium potassium pumps they end up sending out uh, three sodium ions and pulling back in two potassium ions. So three sodium ions go get sent out. Two uh, potassium ions get being pulled back in. Eventually, it leads to this resting state, uh, the the resting state of minus 70 millivolts. And um, keep in mind that um, the reason that we're not having another action potential that can be generated during this absolute refractory period is because we have the um, primarily because of the sodium ions that are open. Okay, so during this state, we cannot get another action potential to occur. However, during this relative refractive period, if the stimulus is strong enough, we can have another action potential generated. Okay, so hopefully you guys understand this. This is important. Expect a handful of questions on the exam coming from uh, this, uh, this chart here, uh, going over all the information that we just talked about, that I talked about in this slide. So be sure you understand this slide as well as those four steps. Uh, these are very important. Again, you will see questions on the exam pertaining to this. Now let's take a look at the conduction velocity or the speed in which the action potential travels. Now keep in mind that the action potentials they only occur in the axons. They don't occur in the dendrite or the cell body, only in the axons. No other area of the cells do we have an action potential that occurs. The action potential conduction velocity and axons vary widely. The rate of action potential propagation, it depends on two factors. One is axon diameter and two is the degree of myelination. For the axon diameter, the larger diameter fibers, they have less resistance to local current flow. So we have faster impulse conduction that takes place. For the degree of myelination, we have two types of conduction depending on the presence or absence of myelin. We have continuous conduction and saltatory conduction. And we're going to be looking at both of these in the next few slides. In continuous conductions, we're looking at non-myelinated axons, and it's going to be slow conduction over here. Keep in mind that action potentials propagate because they get regenerated by the voltage-gated channels in the membrane. Now, in these unmyelinated axons, these voltage-gated channels, they're immediately adjacent to one another. So, each segment, each voltage-gated ja gated channel needs to propagate in action potential. So, we're going from one... Uh, one channel to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. So we're going from one to one to one to one. And this is why it's going to be slow, okay? Because we're going through each one of these adjacent uh, channels throughout this axon. In saltatory conduction, we have the presence of the myelin sheet around the axon, and this causes the action potential to propagate much, much faster. The myelin sheet acts as an insulator, both preventing almost all leakage of charge from the axon and allowing the membrane voltage to change more rapidly. The current can pass through the membrane of a myelinated axon only at the nodes of RON VA because this is where there is no myelin sheath, so the axon is bare at this point. And this is where the voltage gated sodium channels are concentrated and located. And it's over here where the action potential is generated. When an action potential is generated in the myelinated fiber, the local depolarizing current 
doesn't dissipate through the adjacent membrane regions. These regions are non-excitable. Instead, the current is maintained and moves rapidly to the next node, which is a distance of approximately one millimeter, where it triggers another action potential. And as we said earlier, the action potentials are triggered only at the nodes of Ron VA. And this is how we get this name of saltatory conduction. Saltatory means leap, because when you look at it, it looks like the electrical signals are jumping from node to node along the entire axon. So in this image over here, what we're looking at is this bare plasma membranes. And over here, what ends up happening is, uh, where the in stimulus is applied, the voltage is initially high. But then as we go farther away from the site of where the stimulus is applied, the, the voltage starts to decay. So we tend to see this in, in the dendrites. And this voltage decay, it occurs because the current is leaking across the membrane. Okay, so there's nothing over here to protect or to keep these, uh, the current inside. So again, we're having a lot of uh, ions that are leaking across this membrane. And in this image over here, we're looking at these non-myelinated axons. So this is the part of the neuron that we're looking at. So again, there's no myelin sheet around it. Again, so that's why it's called non-myelinated. And what ends up happening over here is that once the stimulus is applied, remember what we have running along the entire length of this uh, axon are these voltage-gated channels. So remember, when the influx of sodium enters the cell, this is what's going to depolarize uh, and cause this uh, depolarize the cell membrane and then cause this action potential to generate. So then, as this uh, action potential propagates along, it moves along uh, this uh, membrane. It gets to this next voltage-gated channel, and then it's going to open it. So when it once it opens, then you get another action potential that starts. So if you notice over here, the signal's strong here, then it starts to weaken out. But when it does weaken out, it opens up this other gated voltage-gated channel. And then you have another strong uh, action potential that's generated, and it goes over here. So this is happening over and over and over and over and over again. So along the entire length, in order for the current to travel from here to here, it has to open up each one of these voltage-gated channels. And this is why continuous conduction is so much slower than in saltatory conduction, where the speed of transmission of propagation is much, much, much more faster. As we discussed, it's, it's up to 30 times faster than in continuous conduction. So now we're looking at this myelinated axon. And in this myelinated axon, when you look over here, this entire axon is covered, okay? And let's take a closer look now. So here's the axon again, and these are this myelin sheet that's covering this axon. But notice that these myelin sheets, they're only a cover about a distance of one millimeter before we have a little bit of a break. So these breaks are called the nodes of Ron VA. And at these nodes of Ron VA, we have this high concentration of these uh, voltage-gated channels that we find. Along this entire length, we don't have that much. And the reason being is because they're covered with this myelin sheet. One of the reasons is because it's covered with the myelin sheet. So what does this mean? Well, when we get a current, the current uh, it's going to move from here to here. So it kind of jumps, right? Because along the way, remember when you look at in this uh, image here in continuous conduction, the voltage, it had to go from one uh, voltage-gated channel to another, and then from here to there, and from here to there. So along this entire way, we had lots and lots. We had many of these uh, voltage-gated channels. Over here, this is not the case. We have these voltage-gated channels that occur F, uh, every one millimeter. So the action potential, it propagates every millimeter. So in other words, it's jumping from, from uh, this uh, voltage-gated channel to the next and from here to the next. So we end up getting this, th this jumping of the action potential. And this is why in saltatory conduction, we see speeds being up to 30 times faster than we see in continuous conduction. Multiple sclerosis or MS is an autoimmune disease that affects primarily young adults. The myelin sheet in the central nervous system gets destroyed. This happens because the person's immune system goes and attacks the myelin. The myelin gets turned into these hardened lesions called scleroses. This causes the impulse conductions to slow down and eventually cease. And then we see an increase in the number of sodium channels in the demyelinated axons. And this is what causes the cycles of relapse and remission. Symptoms we see include visual disturbances, including blindness, problems controlling muscles, so we'll see people being a lot more clumsy, a general weakness. Ultimately, this leads to paralysis. Also, we see a lot of speech disturbances uh, in the urinary incontinence as well. Treatments they include drugs that modify the immune system activity. While we're not able to prevent the onset of MS, we can reduce the risk of developing it by maintaining high levels of vitamin D. Nerve fibers are classified according to diameter, their degree of myelination, and the speed of conduction. They fall into three groups, group A fibers, group B fibers, and group C fibers. Group A fibers have the largest diameter. We find them in myelinated somatic sensory and motor fibers of the skin, skeletal muscles, and joints. 
The speed of conduction is about 150 meters a second, which translates into about 300 miles per hour. So this is very fast. And this is what we find in saltatory conduction. Group B fibers fall in the intermediate diameter range. These are lightly myelinated fibers, and their speed of conduction is about 15 meters per second, or about 30 miles an hour. When you look at group C fibers, these are the smallest diameter, and they're unmyelinated. Their speed of conduction is the slowest, at only about a meter per second, or about 2 miles per hour. So these are the slowest conducting fibers. So clearly you can see these group C fibers are incapable of saltatory conduction. Both B and C groups include ANS visceral motor and sensory fibers that serve the visceral organs. Impaired action potential impulse propagation can be caused by a number of chemical and physical factors. Local anesthetics that act by blocking voltage-gating sodium channels can be a cause. Also, cold temperatures or continuous pressure that interrupt blood circulation and deliver oxygen to neurons can cause that. So this happens when you see them when, you, when your fingers are really cold and they get numb, or when your foot falls asleep when you're in a, uh, a bad position. So if you're squatting for a long period of time, um, you know that could happen as well. Or again, if you're just sitting for a very long period of time and you know you, you got your legs folded, you, you tend to see that. So. This is it for the second part of chapter 11, part B. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Again, please be sure to share with your friends, your classmates, your instructors, anybody you think that may find it helpful. If you have any questions, please be sure to email me directly. I prefer that. Uh, my information is uh, given uh, in the description below. Uh, also, be sure to follow me on Facebook. And uh, again, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you like the video. Uh, and uh, Thank you again for watching the video.